The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So with that, I'd like to uh, first, uh, our first lecturer is uh, John Lewis. John Lewis is the study scientist for this activity. I think he's called distinguished study scientist or um, visiting scientist or something. John is a, a professor at the University of Arizona uh, who um, splits his time or has been splitting his time between Arizona and the state of Washington. He's uh, long been a leader, an author, uh, several books on asteroid mining and the idea of using asteroid resources. Um, and uh, he's been a lecturer on that subject and he's uh, uh, able to join us today and give us a great background on, on, this, on that subject. John. Thank you, Rick. So I have to push this button to talk, huh? No, you don't have to. I don't have good. to. Oh, I'm good. All right. Fine. Um, the, the usual beginning announcement you've already covered, but the way I uh, prefer to hear it is, at the end of this session, please remember to turn your cell phones back on. <laughs> um, I'm going to be giving you a 30-minute presentation on what would normally be packaged as a year-long course. <laughs> so I'm going to have to talk fast, and uh, being a former MIT professor, I will have to encourage you to find the nearest fire hose grasp it firmly with both hands and insert it into your mouth, you're going to be drinking from the fire hose for the next few minutes. And remember, everything will be on the final. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> think outside the box. The purpose of our exercise here today is to think outside the Earth-Moon system. We may be thinking in terms of bodies that actually do pass between the Earth and the Moon from time to time but spend most of their lives well outside this box. We'll be thinking mostly about the near-Earth asteroids, and for those of you who are um, here for the uh, introductory background, not for you experts who have been through this all before, what are near-Earth asteroids and where are they? There are on the order of 1,000 kilometer or larger size near-Earth asteroids, about 400,000 hundred meter sized near-Earth asteroids, they have orbital periods that generally range from 0.9 to 7 years. Orbital inclinations are usually 10 to 20 degrees. Orbital eccentricities range from very low, near zero, to very high, 0 0.9, an orbit characteristic of short period comets. They're mostly, however, uh, centered near 0.5. About one third of all the near Earth asteroids are fated eventually to hit the Earth. Which ones and when? are very important questions, and you will be hearing about that later today. About 20% of the asteroids in, each, in every size category are easier to land on than the moon, meaning that a given booster rocket from Earth can soft land a larger payload on those asteroids than it can on the moon. Of the bodies that are easiest to reach in the solar system, uh, to soft land on their surfaces, the two easiest to get to from Earth are Mars and Venus landing on their surface by means of aerobraking and aerocapture. But then the next 200 in order are near-Earth asteroids, then the Moon. And I'm talking here about kilometer-sized bodies, 200 kilometer-sized bodies. If you will accept 800-meter-sized bodies, double that number. Okay. Here's what, uh, what do I, uh, okay, we need to know what they're made of. We have over 10,000 meteorites here on Earth that have been analyzed. The immediate source of virtually all of these meteorites is the near-Earth asteroid population, which in turn is a derivative population. Most of them are escapees from the asteroid belt or they are extinct short period comets. There are approximately 50 different compositional classes of meteorites known in our collections. If I were to summarize them all for you, I'd be out of time. They range from stainless steel, natural stainless steel, to essentially lake bottom mud with salts and organic material and uh, uh, 
clay minerals and uh, so on in them. Remote sensing in the ultraviolet visible and near IR regions has revealed the spectral classes that uh, many of these asteroids belong to with certain fundamental limitations. One of these is that it has, the asteroid has to be bright enough so that we can get the spectrum of it with decent resolution. This limits us to getting spectral data rather handily on the biggest near-Earth asteroids, but only with great difficulty and at rare intervals for the very small near-Earth asteroids, which we can take spectra of only when they're exceptionally close to Earth and therefore bright enough. We also have spacecraft in situ measurements, and we have a rather um, feeble sample return from the Hayabusa mission, which uh, basically failed in picking up a decent sample and came back contaminated with a little dust, which turns out to be a wonderful source of information for us. The traits of economically desirable near-Earth asteroids are several in number, and uh, they must all be satisfied. They must be easy of access from low Earth orbit or from highly eccentric Earth orbit. Um, for highly eccentric Earth orbit, you might think of a lunar transfer orbit or even possibly a geosynchronous transfer orbit. They must be easy to, it must be easy to return to low Earth orbit or to highly eccentric Earth orbit from that asteroid. There must be an abundance of useful materials on that asteroid and there must exist known, simple, efficient processing schemes, and I might even insert the word unmanned here, for getting useful materials out of those asteroids. Easy access, uh, the next few slides are going to be hitting upon the points that were on that previous slide. Easy access from low Earth orbit means that the perihelion or aphelion distance of the asteroid is close to one astronomical unit, Earth's distance from the sun that the orbit has small eccentricity and low inclination. You pay an energy penalty for more eccentric orbits or for going into inclined orbits. Um, there is some degree of forgiveness associated with the existence of the moon, which is that we can use a lunar swing by to give the spacecraft a, a some eccentricity or inclination uh, in the direction that we prefer. These factors combined with each other allow low outbound delta Vs. These are propulsive velocity changes from low Earth orbit to soft landing. There are roughly 210 kilometer size, I haven't calculated them all, it's too big a job, roughly 210 kilometer size near Earth asteroids that have outbound delta Vs from low Earth orbit less than six kilometers per second versus 6.1 for the moon. Easy return to low Earth orbit from the surface of an asteroid means that the perihelion or aphelion distance is close to one AU. Well, we've met that criterion already. That there is a small cross-range distance between the orbits. Uh, it is quite possible to have an asteroid orbit that crosses Earth's orbit in the sense of passing through one AU, but is never close to Earth's orbit because of the inclination and eccentricity of the orbit. And there has to be favorable orbital phasing. And typically, since these near-Earth asteroids are not in resonant orbits with Earth, every return opportunity is unique. It is different. And the, uh, therefore, the attractiveness of the return opportunity is different. <laughs> we use aero capture at Earth. And uh, these factors allow inbound delta Vs taking off from the surface of the asteroid and returning to low Earth orbit, which are less than 500 meters per second for many dozens of these asteroids, and uh, as low as 60 meters per second in the best cases. And I think you could find at least one automobile in the parking lot out back that is capable of at least 60 meters per second. So if you were, uh, yes. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. That's that's going to be uh, hair raising. Yeah, yeah. And when you see numbers that small, you really uh, want to retreat into the nearest cave, a structurally reinforced concrete cave. 
Uh, abundance is useful materials. What are the most useful materials present on the near-Earth asteroids? Well, on some of them, perhaps as many as uh, a quarter of the near-Earth asteroids, which may be extinct short period comet cores. Water is a very important resource as a source of propellants and life support materials. Um, and uh, then we also have native ferrous metals, which are present in most of the other near-Earth asteroids. Remember that we're using the meteorites that fall on Earth as our guide to the general uh, diversity and composition of the near-Earth population. So most of the near-Earth uh, asteroid fragments that fall to Earth as meteorites contain native ferrous metal alloys, iron, nickel, cobalt, platinum group metals, um, ranging in most cases from about 10 to 30 percent metal, although some are as high as 99 percent metal, those are being the, uh, the so-called iron meteorites. Um, bulk regolith is useful in its own right for radiation shielding and, of course, water-bearing uh, regolith is especially useful for radiation shielding because of the, the talent of water for slowing protons. Platinum group metals for return to Earth, semiconductor metals for return to Earth or for use in solar power satellites. These are minor constituents and I think they're the only ones that are of economic interest for actual return to Earth. The others are for, uh, of interest for use in space. The C, D, and P spectral classes of uh, primitive meteorites contain 1 to 20 percent of water. Extinct near-Earth asteroid or near-Earth object comet cores may be up to 60 percent water ice. There have been a number of thermal history models of the evolution of short period comets that show that they should outgas from their surfaces until they have a lag deposit of black, finely divided dust completely coating the surface, at which point solar heating becomes a negligible effect because the thermal conductivity of the lag deposit of dust is near zero. So they may have very, very long lifetimes preserving that ice under a thin blanket of insulating dust. Um, mature regolith, solar wind hydrogen uh, is found on the moon. It reaches a maximum concentration of about 100 parts per million in uh, ilmenite rich deposits in the Mare Basins on the near side of the moon. And you'll see that that's um, a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than what we expect to find in many of the near Earth asteroids. Not to mention the fact that the moon's harder to get to and harder to get back from. Um, metals, up to 99% in the M class asteroids, and we'll come back to that in a minute and 5 to 30 percent in the primitive, unmelted, undifferentiated chondritic asteroids. And uh, again, a reference to the moon. I mentioned simple, efficient processing schemes. Simple and efficient means low energy con uh, consumption per kilogram of product. That the process requires little or no consumables, especially little or no reliance upon re chemical reagents transported from Earth. They have few mechanical parts because it's mechanical parts that fail. Modular design for ease of repair, highly autonomous operation, and you would certainly want to have on board artificial intelligence expert systems for process control and for uh, adaptive control with, uh, while operating in a, a, an environment in which there are certain to be unknown factors. They have to, uh, these vehicles or these uh, processors would have to have self-diagnosis and self-repair capabilities to a significant degree. They should make maximum use of low-grade solar thermal energy, which implies avoiding the complexity and the uh, mass overhead of power conversion systems wherever possible. And they should use regenerative heat capture whenever possible. Here's some examples of some of these processing schemes. There are books on this subject. There's a literature of several thousand pages on these processing schemes. So this is going to be <clears throat> brief. Ice extraction by the melting and sublimation of native ice using solar or nuclear power. And I would always prefer solar simply on grounds of simplicity and efficiency. Water extraction from hydroxyl silicates, the clay minerals I mentioned that are present in the 
the wettest of the primitive meteorites by solar or nuclear heating. Electrolysis of water and liquefaction of hydrogen and oxygen for use as chemical propellants. So zero G or micro G electrolysis of water. Sounds like a space station process. It is. Ferrous metal volatilization, separation, purification, and deposition by the gaseous Mond process. This, was, uh, this has been in commercial operation since uh, over 100 years ago. The uh, reactions, the essential reactions here are that solid iron nickel alloys reacted with carbon monoxide gas at a pressure of about 100 atmospheres and 100 degrees Celsius. Forms gaseous iron pentacarbonyl and nickel tetracarbonyl, which have about the vapor pressure of liquid water. And those gases can then be separated by fractional distillation, and they can be selectively decomposed, for example, by passing them through a heated mold at 200 degrees Celsius to deposit single crystal deposits of iron or nickel that will fill the mold. This is a commercial process that's been in operation by a couple of companies in the United States. They make finished optical products in one step in a mold. No cutting, grinding, or polishing. So this is, these are potentially very interesting, especially if you want a relatively simple route to growing nuts, bolts, beams, and girders, wires, and so on, out of abundant materials without elaborate equipment. The magnitude of near-Earth asteroid resources, the total near-Earth asteroid mass is about four times 10 to the 18th grams. That's slightly conservative. There are about 10 to the 18th grams of ferrous, met ferrous metals in that collection, about 10 to the 18th grams of water, if we're correct in identifying the very dark, high eccentricity near-Earth asteroids as being extinct short-period comet cores. The Earth's surface market value of the metals in the near-Earth asteroid population are so astronomical as to be irrelevant to reality. Those are in trillions of dollars. You would never think, uh, unless there's some uh, amazing technical breakthrough of bringing iron and nickel back to Earth because it's cheaper to produce them here on Earth. And by the way, much of the production of nickel, cobalt, and platinum group metals here on Earth is done by the Mond process, the gaseous carbonyl process that I just described to you. It is the standard method. If you have a nickel in your pocket that's actually made of nickel, chances are that that nickel was extracted and purified and deposited using the Mond process. High value imports for Earth, platinum, palladium, osmium, iridium, rhodium, and ruthenium, their prices in 2006 and 2011. Platinum has mirrored gold in its price increases. These prices are just a week old. Uh, notice that there's, some of them have not changed much. Notice that rhodium has undergone a massive price crash. There are several stories here. One story is that these metals being sufficiently small in quantity are subject to speculation and price manipulation. So you can see wild fluctuations in prices that, that really have no fundamental meaning. Basically, we're producing enough of these metals uh, to satisfy only a part of the hypothetical demand. They're in short supply. Um, note that palladium has gone up by a factor of three in that time period, and that doesn't seem to be simply speculation. Also dissolved in the iron-nickel native metal alloy, we have nonmetals which are useful in making semiconductors, such as indium, gallium, germanium, arsenic, antimony, selenium, tellurium, and so on. Their prices, as you can see on there, are much lower. So uh, bringing them back to Earth is probably of less interest. High utility materials for use in space. Metals are of enormous use in space. You can produce high purity iron from the iron process, from the Mon process, single step deposition of iron with purity of 99.9999%. Okay? Iron of that level of purity behaves like stainless steel. The corrosion of iron in 
our normal experience is due not to the iron, but is due to impurities in the iron and defects in the iron lattice. If we can purify iron by that process, we can use that iron as iron in place of anything that we would normally make out of stainless steel, such as habitats, propellant tanks, structures. And they're going to be extremely corrosion resistant and extremely strong. Tensile strength of piano wire. High precision chemical vapor deposition of nickel gives you uh, custom, uh, it gives you the possibility of co-depositing iron nickel carbonyl mixtures to make alloys of the composition that you want. And um, you also have the possibility of using any of this material as bulk radiation shielding. The smallest known M-type near-Earth asteroid is Amun. There's good reason to believe it's not really made of metal. So this, uh, this I, ch I continue to use this slide because this would still be the smallest known M-type asteroid. It's about 2,000 meters in diameter. Contains about 30 times the total amount of metals used in human history. It contains over 10 to the 12th grams of platinum group metals with an Earth surface market value of about $70 trillion. And of course, you don't bring it all back at once. <laughs> Near Earth asteroids can offer support for civilization in space. What we do is we calculate the total mass of each material, each such as water, carbon, iron, and so on, present in the, the near-Earth asteroid population. We then calculate the mass of each material that we need to have in circulation to maintain one human life at Western European, Japanese, American, North American standards of living. And we divide to find out how many people could be supported by the near-Earth asteroid population in a continuously recycling regime in which the only input is solar power. The answer is 10 billion people. What about the asteroid belt, you might add, you might ask? The asteroid belt contains one million times as much mass as the near-Earth asteroid population. One million times, 10 billion people could be supported by the resources in the asteroids. The limiting resource, good question, the limiting resource is nitrogen. And uh, if you look forward into the future enough centuries, I think you'll see that uh, rather than fighting over oil, we'll be fighting over sources of nitrogen. It's our limiting resource. Yes, we need it, fire suppression. The low Earth, uh, the <laughs> in low Earth orbit, we have a demand for propellants, for transfer to higher orbits and to more distant destinations. And we have a demand for radiation shielding for space stations. In geosynchronous orbit, we have a demand for structural metals for solar power satellites. And it sure would be nice to bring the mass of solar power satellites downhill into Earth's gravity field rather than uphill from the ground. The cost of providing it would be far lower. In geosynchronous orbit, you also need station keeping propellants and you need photovoltaics for solar power satellites. Water is of tremendous interest as a propellant. The direct use of water as a propellant can be by means of solar thermal propulsion, STP, or nuclear thermal propulsion, where you simply use that source of energy to heat the water up to very, very high temperatures and emit it as an exhaust. Um, there have been uh, studies of the dynamics and the control systems needed for solar thermal propulsion done as early as 30 or 40 years ago by Jim Shoji at Rocketdyne that are still valid, still in the literature, and still, as far as I know, unsurpassed. Nuclear thermal propulsion, same thing. You just run the water through a reactor and blast out extremely high temperature water vapor. If you electrolyze the water to hydrogen and oxygen, you then have three options open. One is hydrogen solar thermal power, uh, th propulsion. Hydrogen solar thermal propulsion is capable of much higher specific impulses than the steam rocket because you're exhausting a gas with a much higher thermal speed with a mass of two instead of 18. And uh, hydrogen nuclear thermal propulsion. And finally, hydrogen oxygen chemical propulsion with a classic example given on the right. Okay, 
the typical near-Earth asteroid that has a perihelion rather close to Earth, and here painting with a broad brush, they generally do, we wouldn't call them near-Earth asteroids, they typically have aphelia out in the asteroid belt. So once you've established a station on a near-Earth asteroid, chances are it will give you a free visit to the asteroid belt on every orbit around the sun. Typical orbital period, three, five, seven years. The, uh, the regolith of the near-Earth asteroid, which is very easy to handle and push around, most near-Earth asteroids have regolith, um, can provide handy radiation shielding if you land a, a populated module on the surface of this asteroid, you can cover it with dirt without, without exceptional difficulty. The uh, materials of the asteroid may provide propellants if you've chosen the right kind of asteroid. You can choose an asteroid that provides a pretty decent Earth-Mars transfer orbit. It has a perihelion near Earth and an aphelion near Mars. And uh, with sufficiently small asteroids, you can modify the orbit to provide the parameters that you want for a transfer to Mars. So the near-Earth asteroids can be used as traveling hotels, traveling gas stations, traveling factories, but colonies, uh, not an exciting place to live, except during times of imminent collision with the planet where it's more exciting than you would want. Most of the near-Earth asteroids are fated to collide with the planet eventually. Some, something like 85% of them will hit one of the terrestrial planets or Jupiter eventually. The rest will either get kicked out of the solar system completely as a result of an accidental close pass by Jupiter or fall into the sun, a fate which is not recommended either. The Martian connection. So the near-Earth asteroids are potential transportation aids to get to Mars. Missions to the near-Earth asteroids, as Tom Jones will be describing later today, can serve as full-up rehearsals for manned Mars landings in which you do the full delta V performance of the rockets involved, but you do it without ever being deep in somebody else's gravity well. Phobos and Deimos can be regarded as former near-Earth asteroids parked in areocentric orbit, and as such, they are potential resources for exploitation and potential bases for observation of Mars. Space colonization. I have never started out with the purpose of colonizing space. So let's ask the question here, does it make any sense from this perspective? Asteroids are primarily mine sites. They are not resorts. They are not suburbs. Early exploitation of the near-Earth asteroids should be simple, energy efficient, and unmanned. And I emphasize the un. People will arrive as needed, if needed, when needed. This is not a modern vision. This dates back to Tsiolkovsky in 1903 and Goddard in 1908. Space colonization is not our beginning goal. If it happens, it will be as a response to compelling opportunities. Asteroids over the moon, well, that, yes, I photoshopped that. <laughs> That's Jack Schmidt down there, not looking up. Um, the strong points of the asteroids relative to the moon are low, Delta V outbound for the best of the near-Earth asteroids, the best 20% or so. Very low Delta V inbound. Resource richness and diversity. The moon, by comparison, looks like the slag that we reject from metallurgical processes here on Earth. Now, now don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying it's useless. I'm not saying that we can't think of things to do with it. But in terms of richness and diversity, of valuable resources, the near-Earth asteroids win hands down. But there are certain advantages that the moon has. Short trip times and the possibility of helium-3 recovery. The moon has a gardened regolith. The near-Earth asteroids tend to lose regolith at the drop of a hat or at the drop of a small asteroid. So the near-Earth asteroids don't accumulate very much helium-3. Even the so-called gas-rich meteorites have far lower concentrations of helium-3 than the uh, Ilmenite-rich Murray basins on the moon. 
So can the helium-3 be recovered economically? That's not my story. I am a big skeptic. Okay, I'm watching, I'm watching my lights here. Uh, uh, okay, the roles of private enterprise in this, I think, are crucial. Sure, the government has a role in fundamental technology development and in fundamental exploration. Low-cost competitive access to space is the key to large-scale space development. Large-scale competitive mineral exploration and efficient competitive resource exploitation are also keys to economy. This word competitive doesn't seem to influence NASA's choice of missions or the economy of its launch services. If you don't get that joke, <laughs> talk to me later. Construction and operation of communication and transportation hubs can be done very well by, uh, as we know, by competitive private systems. We cannot afford a centrally controlled, duplication-free, government-dominated effort. Okay, Tsiolkovsky, back in 1904, gave 14 points for the development of the uh, solar system. And these are the first seven pretty basic stuff up through 1965. Numbers eight through 14 are of more interest. Space suits, we did that in 1965. Space agriculture as the source of food. Earth orbiting space colonies. Use of solar energy for transportation and power in space. Exploitation of asteroid resources, said Tsiolkovsky in 1903. Then the industrialization of space. And finally, are you with me on this? Wait for it. The perfection of mankind and society. I don't think any of us would claim that we have achieved number 14 yet. But the sobering fact is that the last time we made noticeable progress on Tsiolkovsky's list was 1965. And we should put in here the exploration of the solar system. The manned exploration of the solar system came to an end in 1973. Will we resume it? only if there's sufficient incentive. Suggested reading. By the way, all of these uh, slides will be in my paper, and you can uh, refer to them uh, to get the things that you could not swallow from the fire hose as I was administering it. Um, the, a paper on the legal regime for space resource utilization, looking in terms of the, uh, the existing laws on the subject and what you can and cannot do, and where you can and cannot do it. And you'll see my subtitle down there in the corner. Best not spoken out loud. This is what we're looking for. We're looking at the solar system as a, an arena for human endeavor, both unmanned and manned. And we're looking outside the box now. We may have the moon in the foreground, but we've got Mars and the moons of Mars. We've got the near-Earth asteroids in the same box now. Okay, that's it. <laughs>